Hi there, I'm Rebecca and a really warm welcome back to my channel, Pumpkin Becky. In this week's video, we are going to... Hi there, I'm Rebecca and a really warm welcome back to my channel, Pumpkin Becky. The weather has been officially crazy and this week we are going to take a bit of a look around the garden. We are going to see what's surviving, what's thriving and what we can harvest and basically just give ourselves permission to give ourselves a week off really let's get started for the last nearly two weeks we've had temperatures in the high 30s and it's too much for me it's too much for this little one uh, so we've just felt really flat really flat not wanting to do anything very much um, I, I work full-time so coming home from work after a long hot horrible day to then think about going into the garden to tend things is sometimes a bit more than I can deal with It's also been really difficult to decide what to water and what not to water. We've been threatened with biblical thunderstorms for the last couple of weeks and so far absolutely nothing has come of it. So what do you do? Do you water everything? Do you prioritise some things over others? And I guess I answer that with more questions. How well do you know your garden? How well do you trust the weather reports that are coming up? And what sort of thing is it that you're thinking about watering? So let's talk about what I do water and what I don't water. I do not water the lawn. It's pointless. It's looking pretty dead right now. There's a few patches of green here and there, but I know that once we move into a slightly cooler phase and there's more consistent rain and more sun that this grass will just shoot straight back up again and it will be absolutely fine. I've got some bare patches where Katie's been scratching and might have to reseed that. We'll see. I also don't water this border at all. Um, the things that are in it are pretty drought tolerant and if I did water I would find that the ivy growing up the fence would suck most of that because the roots go far and they're really thick and fibrous and they just suck all the moisture out anyway. Better to try and grow these things hard and let them just deal with what they've got than to try and mollycoddle them along with water things like the hibiscus in the tub that does get watered being in a tub it will drain through very quickly it will dry very quickly on the top to a crust so although the soil in there is very good and will retain moisture whilst also being free draining it does need regular watering to keep it okay I also don't water the hawthorn tree bed those roots just suck every molecule of water out of the soil. The things I grow on top of those roots have to be hardy and capable of dealing with drought. That's why I tend to grow Mediterranean type herbs like marjoram and oregano which are great for the bees and also survive <laughs> really well in this very droughty bit of soil. This is full west facing so it gets beaten by the sun all day long. You'll notice I've got a couple of wasp traps up. That's to try and keep them away from the bees in their hive. Uh, we have had incidents where wasps have predated our bees and it's devastating. Uh, we also last year caught an awful lot of hornets in these traps. This bed behind me has been watered, um, mainly because I've only recently planted the sunflowers in here. <laughs> I say recently, it's maybe a month. I'm not actually sure. They started pretty small and they have shot up. 
We also had some pretty devastatingly strong winds, which has taken a toll on several things around the garden, which again we'll see in a minute. The sunflowers were standing beautifully tall and their stems were strong enough to hold the heads up and they were standing all straight and lovely and tracking the sun like they do. And then these winds came through and now they're just a bit, well. <laughs> and I obviously don't water this bed too liberally. I'm very specific and targeted when I water. I don't just put the um, shower head setting on and then just sort of twiddle it round. I will stand there and I hold it over the root ball of a, a single plant for 30 seconds, something like that, until I can see there's a good puddle, watch it soak in, go away, maybe do the next one and then by the time I've done the same to that one the water will have gone into the soil on the first plant and I will come back give it a second watering that makes sure that the water really gets down into that soil rather than just sitting on the very surface where the roots just cannot access it and in the sort of heat and humidity we've we've had it's entirely ineffective that kind of watering so a very good sustained drenching if you don't use a hose pipe then you can do it with watering cans obviously but a targeted watering on things that are new um, and maybe on things that are starting to look a little bit stressed things where the leaves are starting to droop down a bit uh, try and catch them before it's too late it's much better to do one or maybe two waterings like that a week than to just kind of tickle around with a dribble of water every day because that's absolutely pointless. So things that I've just planted, things that are in pots and things that will give us food crops are the other bracket of things that I will water properly more often. And when I say more often I mean that sustained drink once, twice. With food crops it's probably more like three times a week. Behind me, just outside the greenhouse, you can see a very dried husk of a plant. That was one of my pots of sweet peas. So they grew beautifully, they flowered fantastically, they smelt amazing. But then about the end of July, the aphids just took over. The tops of the plants, the lovely nice sweet, sweet new growth, suddenly starts to look very thick. Now, what's going on there? Oh no, they were just absolutely coated all the way around with aphids, big fat aphids. So rather than trying to fight that losing battle with them, I'd wash them off, I'd use soap, but they were in that real bloom phase of their growth cycle. And I couldn't fight it. They were tending to stay off everything else in the garden because they had such a great fodder crop with the sweet peas. And I thought, you know what, the sweet peas are starting to get a little bit less prolific with their flowers. Let's just let the aphids have them. So I stopped watering the sweet peas because I was just going to let the aphids have them. And we have ended up with this dried, dried husk of a plant. Behind me on the obelisk is Runner Bean Crusader. It has taken it a hot minute to get up these poles, but it is there now and I've seen the odd bean, but nothing particularly wowsome. Let's, um, let's go and see what's actually in there, shall we? Sometimes with plants like this, you find that they might be flowering lots and lots throughout the season, but it takes them a really long time to set that first fruit. The conditions need to be perfect, the pollinators need to be there, and you might get that one thing, but then it takes an awful long time for it to produce the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And sometimes I have found with peas and beans, 
what you actually need to do is rather than wait for a an eatable quantity eatable edible like a meal's worth of a thing sometimes you just have to get in there and pick the first one or two because the plant is thinking oh success i have made seeds i need to do no more thank you and it won't actually produce anything else of any great significance but if you keep an eye on things and actually get in there and um, runner beans are particularly good at hiding their beans particularly good <laughs> and I've got a horrible feeling there's one in here that I haven't spotted um, so it is important to just sort of go through lift up the leaves and you, you'll feel any unusual weight of fruit or vegetables, whatever they are. I've got... <laughs> these ones are bonkers. I've got a few like this which are just so curly-whirly. It's not true. They are like a... I don't know. <laughs> Here's the one I missed. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I missed that one, didn't I? That is... That is a foot long. That is officially 30 centimetres long. But they hide them so well in amongst that foliage. They are perfectly coloured to avoid detection. So that is why it's important to inspect your plants regularly. Now, if you've collected a really good quantity of rainwater through the season, fantastic. Use it, but use it wisely. Don't just fiddle it about onto things. Do what I said, water deeply and water less often. And that really will benefit the plants far more. Now we are at my French beans. These are a mixture. I actually bought a packet which had a green, a purple and a yellow French bean in. And part of my mind wanted to separate them out because you can tell from the colour of the bean what colour beans they're going to produce ultimately. But then I thought, no, I'm going to put them all on one wigwam and see what I get. So we're going to harvest these now. I'm finding they're popping off quite easily just between my fingertips but you can of course use scissors and I've got, oh wow, I've got scissors and secateurs with me. There we go, that's the colour difference, the purple, the yellow and the green. Good size, the yellow ones actually started fruiting first and are certainly producing more sizeable pods than um, the other two colours. But I'm actually not interested in the size, it's the flavour. This is not a huge plant pot, so it is important to keep this well hydrated this whole planter was completely blown over during that recent windstorm so I am impressed that I've still got anything coming off you can see there's been some damage to the plant the things have got bent broken pick small quantities regularly and the plant will continue to produce for you don't leave them sitting on the plant until you have enough to make a meal and if you can't get enough to make a meal or to add to a meal then open freeze them stick them on a tray in the freezer and then once they have frozen gather them up pop them into a bag and leave them in the freezer and you can just keep adding to those bags through the season this is tomato tumbler that I planted in one of my videos. The first branch to actually tumble was this one. Then I realised it hadn't tumbled at all, it had snapped. And 
it has been hanging on by half, if not a third of the thickness of the stem, almost for a couple of months. But it is producing mountains of tomatoes. So I pay particular attention to this particular plant because that extra weight will put extra stress onto that terrible, terrible joint. Now we're in the square foot vegetable beds and this has been watered a lot more often and consistently than the, the ornamental flower beds. I haven't worried so much about those but where I've got actual food crops growing I am concentrating my efforts there. The Leaning Tower of Beans are over here on my Borlotti beans and during the windstorm they ended up on their side completely and when I went to investigate what had happened one of the supporting canes had actually snapped in two right low down so there's nothing I could do about it so I keep trying to prop it up or triangulate it off other things to try and hold it up a bit better before I do that this time I will see what beans I've got to harvest it is cropping beautifully These are the Hanksnix planters that I reviewed a few weeks ago and I haven't actually thinned them or anything since we last looked. I have continued to water deeply but this is the, the first time we've gone to pull any. I can now start looking for the bigger plants and pulling them rather than thinning out the weaker ones. If I pull out the thicker ones and leave space for the smaller ones to come through, they will then start to develop into better size for carrots. Aren't they gorgeous? And because I've been watering deeply, I haven't got masses and masses of hair roots on the outside. They're just cleaning off really nice and quickly with a couple of swipes of the hand. Fantastic. So beautifully straight. Here we've got some where the tops are starting to green. They are more at the front and more exposed to the sun so that's why they are going green. You can just earth up a little bit more around those to stop that happening. Sometimes as you're watering you'll find that you are actually pushing the soil away from the plant and so that can make that happen. So yeah, just make sure you keep the earth over the top of the, the carrots as much as possible. So that's probably now the final thinning I need to do on those carrots. I've got about 30, 31 left in the bed and I've got a further 30 something here in my hands and these are really beautiful sized carrots and if you're wondering who likes carrots the most in our household allow me to show you <laughs> Katie does love her carrots I know you're throwing it everywhere need to actively harvest today so let's just have a quick look at some of the pumpkins and squashes that are coming along so nicely there's red curry I'm ready to pick that one here's my absolutely beautiful crown prince look at him stunning really grown a lot since last time we looked then I've also got some growing here and they're actually using the cover that I have over the square footbed to climb up which is really funny 
and if we look at the Crown Prince main vine again it's now up onto the roof of the chicken run there's going to be a gorgeous crop of grapes from the plants that grow over the pergolas here also been taking crops of the dahlia plants because wow they are looking amazing the pompons were the first ones to come out and the big heads have now subsided into the smaller sort of secondary sizes This cracker is creme de cassis. I definitely need to come through and dead head again. Now we know that I don't do orange, but this one is called Mystic Spirit. And I bought it with a fairy garden in mind. And yeah, it's really rather beautiful. This is Edge of Joy. It's probably on its sort of second or third round of flowers, so they are getting much, much smaller. The first one was that sort of size, and now we're down to about a third the size. Finally, we're just going to come into the greenhouse, have a little look at the tomatoes. This Van Muren one that was the replacement for the one that I wanted is really irritating me. Um, it's a grafted variety, it should be really lovely and strong but it's pathetic. Next to it is good old F1 variety Shirley. She's got some fabulous sized tomatoes growing. They are just starting to ripen. Actually going to strip off a few extra leaves just to try and get the sun to them a bit more. I might have to move my pot of gladiola out the way just so that the sun can really get at them. And I'm waiting in the wings for it to be less oppressively hot are some kohlrabi, uh, that's some more pak choy, joy choy, <laughs> got some um, savoy cabbage and some red chard, ruby chard. They are looking horrendous and that's mostly because due to the heat I've had to have the door open the whole time and that means that cabbage white butterflies have been able to get in and have their wicked way and lay their eggs on my plants. Also flea beetle have been a problem that's the holes that you can see there are caused by flea beetle whereas the bigger chunks of leaf that have disappeared are very much due to cabbage white butterfly caterpillars. I come in and I regularly pick everything off. My hope is that once this really hot spell is over and done with that I can get these planted out and that given the right conditions they will recover. So here's my awesome harvest. I'm really pleased with all of this. It's all fantastic. The tomatoes will be quite happy on my kitchen side and we will pop them on a little sweets because they're so fabulous. Um, the other things will end up in the fridge. Okay, right, that's it for this week's video. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to rate, share and subscribe to me here on YouTube. And until next time, bye.